Okay, so let us continue. Uh, today we are going to solve some examples. So first example is we have a machine and then it is supported over a spring and a dashboard. Now, at the center of this machine, there is a rotating part. So, that is the rotating part. So, it rotates in a circular path. So, now this machine has a mass of capital M and it is say 150 kg. Now, this small mass, it has a eccentricity and this entire assembly rotates. So, it rotates with a RPM and for this small mass, it is given a 42 kg mass and the eccentricity E is 4.5 centimeter. Then it rotates with an RPM and the RPM is given 750 RPM. <coughs> Now, the stiffness and damping, so the stiffness of this entire assembly, it is given, so 105 kilo Newton per meter and the damping is defined by critical damping ratio and in this case it is 5 percent. Now, first part of the question is derive the equation of motion and the second part is determine the peak displacement of the machine. Now, first thing we have to derive the equation of motion. So, We just define the degrees of freedom. So, it is in the vertical direction x of t. So, m minus small m times x double dot that is the inertia force and then obviously, we have to also consider the inertia of that small mass. So, that we can find out. So, if I just draw this mass so it is at an angle of this is say lambda times t now obviously we can find out so this is the displacement of the mass. So, if this is eccentricity E, then this vertical displacement is E times sin lambda t. So, this mass will also experience the acceleration and the net displacement is x plus e times sin 
lambda t and if this net displacement if we differentiate twice with respect to t we will get the acceleration plus c times x dot plus k times x. So, this is the equation of motion. Now, if we further simplify what we can do is open the bracket and obviously, this small m times x double dot will get cancelled. So, we will be left with m x double dot plus c x dot plus k x and if we differentiate twice this uh, second term in the th second bracket and then take it on the right hand side what we will get m e lambda square sin lambda t. Now, that is the equation of motion. So, we have already solved this and x max that is the maximum amplitude you can recall this is m e lambda square divided by the stiffness k and then whole divided by square root of 1 minus r square whole square plus twice eta r whole square. So, if we solve the second part, this is the peak deformation. So, this is the peak displacement, but for that we have to evaluate. So, let us first check what is lambda. So, rpm is given. So, that is 7 5 0 into 2 pi by 60. And if you do that, you will get the rpm in radian per second. This will be 78.54. Similarly, we can also find out natural frequency W n or omega n is k by m square root of that quantity. Now, if you do that, we are given the stiffness and also the mass. Then if you do that, you will get the natural frequency of this system is 23.39 radian per second. And together these two gives us ratio of these two frequencies lambda by omega n and if you find it out you will get it is 3.36. So, we have all the informations we need. So, x max is equal to m that is 42 kg times small e eccentricity. So, it is 4.5 divided by 100 times we have lambda square. So, lambda is 78.54 whole square and then divided by k. So, our k is 105 into 10 to the power 3 and then whole divided by square root of 1 minus 3.36 square whole square plus 2 times eta that is 5 percent 0 5 into 3.36 whole square. Now, if you do that calculation, you will get this 1 by this third bracketed quantity that is dynamic amplification and it is 0 0.097 and times 
the terms in the numerator will give you 0 0.111 and then finally, the maximum deformation is 0 0.0177 meter. So, that means 10.77 millimeter. So, we get the amplitude of the peak deformation in this case it is 10.77 millimeter. So, it tells you how we can solve this type of problem where we have rotational um, unbalance and then uh, we can also use the theory that we have developed to find out the response of the structure. And when we design this obviously, this peak response is the main factor against which we design the structure. So, we have to design it such a way that it can withstand this level of deformation. Now, so this problem is clear how we can actually solve the problem where we have rotational force, act, rotational unbalance uh, acting on a single degree of freedom system. So, let us consider a different example. So, in this case again, we have a engine. So, the mass of the engine is 675 kg, <coughs> which is supported on a spring whose stiffness is 2 75 kilo Newton per meter. It has a small rotating mass of 25 kilogram. The rotational speed is 3 to 5 rpm and the stroke length is 350 millimeter. Consider three point five per cent critical damping ratio. And then find the dynamic amplification then transmissibility and the force transmitted to the foundation.
Okay. So, let us solve this problem. So, what we are given capital M in this case is 675 kg and the small m is equal to 25 kg. The stiffness is 275 kilo Newton per meter. Stroke length that is eccentricity in this case is 350 millimeter and the RPM is 325, critical damping ratio is 3.5 percent, fine. So, with that information, so let us first find out what is lambda that is 325 into 2 pi by 60. So, that is the RPM. Now, if you do that, you will get this is 34.03 radian per second. Then let us find out natural frequency that is square root of k by m. So, in this case we have uh, mass given. So, 275 into 10 to the power 3 divided by we have 675. So, if you do this calculation, you will get 20.18 radian per second and together these two will give us r which is the ratio of lambda and omega n. So, in this case it is 1.7. Now, we can find out what is the magnitude of the mass. So, the amplitude of this rotating assembly will offer a sinusoidal mass and that is small m e lambda square. So, if you just put the values, so 25 kg mass times small e, so that is 0.35 times we have lambda, so in this case 34.03 whole square. So, this will be 10132.86 Newton. Okay, so, let us find out first dynamic magnification factor. So, dynamic magnification factor is 1 by square root of 1 minus r square whole square plus twice eta r whole square. So, this is 1 by square root of 1 minus r is 1.7 square whole square plus twice eta is in 0 0.035 times 1.7. So, the value of dynamic magnification is 0.53. Now, if you recall the shape of dynamic magnification is something like this. Now, this is close to or equal to 1. So, we have somewhere here that is r equal to 1.7. Obviously, here, so it will be less than static deformation. So, in this case, it is 0.53. Now, if we continue x max that is the maximum deformation is uh, m is e lambda square 
whole divided by k divided by 1 minus r square whole square plus twice eta r whole square. So, we have already estimated the magnitude of the force. So, that peak magnitude is uh, F naught and that is 10132.86 divided by the stiffness is 275 into 10 to the power 3 and then whole divided by 1 minus 1.7 square whole square plus twice eta r. So, that is 2 times 0 0.035 into 1.7 whole square. And if you find out, this will be 0 0.0196 meter. That means, x max is 19.6 millimeter. So, dynamic magnification we have figured out, then transmissibility is the next task and then we will find out the force transmitted to the foundation. So, transmissibility T r, if you recall the expression, so it is 1 plus twice eta r whole square, then the complete thing under square root, then 1 minus r square whole square plus twice eta r whole square. So, what we have here is 1 plus 2 times 0 0.035 times 1.7 whole square and then divided by 1 minus 1.7 square whole square plus 2 times 0 0.035 times 1.7 whole square. And if you solve this, you will see the transmissibility is 0.534. Now, the last part is force transmitted to the foundation. So, force transmitted to the foundation is what? Transmissibility times the force, amplitude of the force that we have already figured out. So, this is the amplitude of the force and then we have calculated the transmissibility of this system. So, what we have 0 0.534 times we have 10132.86 and that uh, is uh, 5410.95 Newton. So, obviously, it is 5.41 kilo Newton. So, that is the force transmitted to the foundation. So, when you design the foundation, that is the force against which you have to design the foundation. So, it clearly shows how we can solve the problem where we have um, a system with a rotating component. So, we can find out the dynamic amplification, then transmissibility and the force transmitted to the foundation. Now, there are certain structures where actually some internal force may develop and in those cases, uh, those internal forces actually can uh, cause some instability. So, uh, these are called self excited system. So, before we close this module, let me just quickly discuss if we have this type of system, how they actually behave. Now, just imagine we have the same single degree of freedom system and then it has a spring.
and a dash pot. So, the mass is m, spring stiffness k, damping constant c and it has only 1 degrees of freedom x of t. But in this case, we have some forcing function f of t. So, we know what is the equation. Equation is m x double dot plus c x dot plus k x is equal to f of t. Now, we have already solved this type of problem where uh, we define this forcing function, but today let us assume that our forcing function is nothing but f naught times x dot. So, that is the forcing function f naught times x dot. So, what does it mean? This forcing function f of t, it is actually proportional to x dot. So, that is the assumption we have and if that is the case, let us see what happens. So, we can, I mean, remodify uh, this equation and then write it in its mass normalized form. So, what we have c minus f naught divided by m times x dot plus k by m times x is equal to 0. Obviously, there will be some initial conditions for the time being, let us not focus on that. Now, again, if we look at the solution of this system, so what we do, we again assume some trial solution, right. So, the trial solution, let us assume x of t to be say some constant a times a to the power lambda t. Then what we can do, we can actually rewrite that same equation. What we have is uh, lambda square plus c minus f naught by m times lambda plus k by m is equal to 0. That is the characteristic equation. So, what we do? We find out lambda 1, lambda 2. So, in this case, if we do that, so what we will get? minus c minus f naught by m plus minus square root of c minus f naught by m whole square minus 4 times k by m. This will be divided by 2 Right, and then let us look at this square root of this third bracketed term. So, now case 1, if we look at c minus f naught by m whole square is greater than 4 times k by m. So, that is the first condition. So, if that condition uh, is satisfied, what will happen? Then we will have lambda 1 and lambda 2, these are real positive and unequal. Now, under this condition, what is the solution x of t? If you recall, x of t is c 1 e to the power lambda 1 t plus c 2 e to the power lambda 2 t. Now, obviously, uh, there will be no vibration. So, it is a diverging and non oscillating, obviously unstable, right. So, that is the first case. Let us investigate what will be the second case. Case 2 is when c minus f naught by m whole square is equal to 
4 times k by m. In that case, the square root term will be 0. So, what we have lambda 1 and lambda 2, they are real but equal. So, in this case also we have diverging non oscillating type and obviously unstable case. Right. Now, there is a third condition when we will have, so case 3, third condition is when we have this C minus F naught by M whole square and this is less than 4 times K by M. So, that means C minus F naught by M is less than twice omega M. So, that is the condition. Now, under this condition, what is X of t? X of t will be some constant e to the power minus C minus F naught by M uh, times uh, by it will be 2 i same times t and then sin you will have square root of um, 4 k by m minus c minus f naught by m whole square times t plus theta. So, obviously, when you have C greater than F naught. So, let us focus on this uh, exponential term. So, if you have C greater than F naught, what we have? We have a damped free vibration. This we have already studied, right. So, on the right hand side you have this sinusoids. So, the solution will be exponentially decaying sinusoid. So, you will have vibration. Now, when we have C equal to F, now obviously C equal to F means this e to the power minus 0 times t. So, this is as good as free sorry the first one is damped forced vibration. So, this is the next case is undamped free vibration. Yeah, both of them are correct. So, in the first case when we have C greater than F naught obviously, e to the power minus of some constant times T. So, there will be exponential decay. So, we will have damped free vibration case. And when we have C equal to F naught then in that case there is no exponential decay term. So, it will be undamped free vibration case. Now, the interesting case is when we have C is less than F naught. Now, when C is less than F naught obviously, C minus F naught is negative. So, it will be positive. So, in this case we will have again a diverging um, unstable oscillation. And that is the most interesting part. So, if you have a force recall our force F naught is sorry F of t is equal to F naught times x dot. So, our force F of t is proportional to x dot of t. So, that was the condition with which we started. Now, if this F naught 
is controlled in such a way that this F naught is more than this C, then we have damped free vibration. So, if this F naught is more than C, then we have diverging unstable oscillation. So, long your damping C is greater than F naught, we have damped free vibration. Now, that is a case of what we call self uh, exciting uh, system. We will solve an example in a minute, we will see how uh, it actually affects the oscillation. We will slightly modify uh, the force that we have already considered, but in that case also we will see how it can lead to unstable oscillation. Now, this example uh, clearly tells you that how to develop the equation and for this type of system, if we have a forcing function which is proportional to the velocity, then it effectively actually affects the net damping force. And that is the reason if we have uh, F naught which is more than the damping constant, obviously we will encounter some un unstable oscillation. So, let us consider an example. As I said, we will slightly modify. In this case, we will not consider the forcing function is proportional to X dot, but let us see what happens. So, what we have here is So, we have a pipe and the length of this pipe is say capital L and some fluid is coming out with a velocity of V. So, it has a cross sectional area which is say A and the density of the fluid flowing is rho. Now, obviously, it is a cantilever pipe. So, it will deform and the mass of this cantilever along with the fluid inside that acts over this pipe. So, for the time being, uh, let us um, consider uh, a SDF representation of the pipe. So, what we will do effectively, uh, we will actually assume what is the effective mass at the free end and obviously, this is a cantilever pipe. So, it will offer some stiffness, right. So, we have to find out what is the effective stiffness and what is effective mass. Then we can find out what will be the oscillation in the vertical direction. So, the pipe actually vibrates in this direction because of this flow. We will see in a minute. Uh, so, that is the degrees of freedom x of t. Now, the stiffness offered by this pipe. So, this pipe is uh, of length L and the flexural rigidity is E i. Right. So, the stiffness offered by this pipe in the vertical direction that we know it is 8 E i by L cube. Now, the moment we have this fluid flowing out with a velocity v, then at this free end because of this flowing fluid mass, so we will have a force. So, that is say fluid force F L. So, that is rho A v square. Now, let us just draw the deformed shape of this pipe. So, what will happen? It will try to deflect like this. As you know, the deformed shape. Now,
Now, this fluid force is acting. So, that is the direction of fluid and say at the free end it makes an angle alpha or theta. So, that is the net deformation delta. Now, for a cantilever beam we know what is y that is the deformation it is effectively some UDL w in this case we can actually find out uh, the fluid mass per unit length and that will give us the idea of this UDL. So, w is the UDL so w x square divided by 24 i and then times x square plus 6 l square minus 4 l x. So, that is the deformation. So, if we put x equal to l we can actually find out this uh, free end deformation is uh, w l to the power 4 divided by 8 i. And we can also find out theta. So, the expression for theta will be w divided by 24 e i and then within bracket 4 x cube plus 12 l square x minus 12 l x square. And again in this expression if you put x equal to capital L, so we will get theta at the free end and that theta will be w l cube divided by 6 e i. Now, all of you can derive these expressions because uh, it is normally covered in uh, structural analysis. So, now we have the complete information. So, this force at the free end will have again two components. So, one in the horizontal direction, one in the vertical direction. So, the fluid force acting in the vertical direction. So, F L comma sorry this is L comma V vertical direction is nothing but rho a v square sin theta. Now, for small theta obviously, we can modify this it will be effectively sin theta is equal to theta. So, it is theta. Now, that is the force and then under that load the deformation we have already figured out. So, we can find out what is the stiffness or resistive force per unit deformation. So, F L V comma delta. So, if you do that we know the expression for numerator and denominator also we know that is the expression. So, if we put these two expression what we will get is 4 rho a v square divided by thrice l. Now, what is this effective stiffness? This is the stiffness offered by the pipe whose flexural rigidity is given. So, we have k v minus then we have this component. So, it is k fluid v. So, we have 8 
E i by L cube minus 4 rho a v square divided by tri cell. Now, if we write down the equation of motion, so equation of motion, we have the effective mass, mass effective times x double dot that is the inertia force plus we have 8 E i by L cube minus 4 rho a v square divided by tri cell times x is equal to 0. And for the time being, uh, we are not considering damping. As I said, this example will uh, slightly modify from what we have discussed in the previous example. Now, just by looking at this bracketed term, we can actually see that there can be two situations. So, if 8 E i divided by L cube is greater than 4 rho A V square divided by tri cell, then in that situation we will have a free vibration that we have already discussed. We are not looking at that case. Now, the moment we have 8 E i divided by L cube is less than 4 rho A V square by tri cell. Then what will happen? This bracketed term, the coefficient will be negative and under this situation, we will have unstable case. And from this expression, we can find out what is the effective V. So, V square should be greater than 8 E i times 3 L divided by L cube times 4 rho A V sorry. Now, this 4 and 8, 8 will get cancelled. So, what we have is uh, and then L also will get cancelled. So, this will be L square. So, what effectively what we have V greater than square root of 6 E i by rho A L square is the condition that defines the instability in the system. So, this is another example where we can see that the system can develop some force in this case because of the fluid flowing through the pipe, it actually develops a force in the opposite direction and then that force actually effectively reduces the stiffness in the vertical direction. And um, if this condition is satisfied, if you have a velocity which is more than this uh, expression we have derived, then uh, for that velocity we will have uh, unstable um, case and it will start behaving in a completely different way than we have in case of free vibration uh, that we have already studied. So, these are some of the examples where structures can generate some force inside the structure and that can be detrimental. So, when you study this type of system, be careful because this kind of self excited system can cause lot of instability within the structure. So, with that let us close here and uh, in the next class we will see uh, different types of forcing function and how we can uh, find out the solution of a single degree of freedom system when we have uh, other type of forcing functions and gradually we will move over to arbitrary forcing function because uh, in case of structural engineering, 
if you consider response uh, of a structure against earthquake, the earthquake motion is actually a random uh, input. So, gradually we will develop how to solve the response of a structure when we have uh, arbitrary forcing function. So, that will cover in the following week. Thank you very much. Thank you.